Welcome to Hero or Disruptor, exploring the power of teaching metaphors. I'm Garth Neufeld. In this series, Jane Hallinan and I take a deep dive into the hero's journey as applied to teaching, while also considering the transformational power of disruption. So where will you see yourself? As a guide to the next generation of heroes? Or as a disruptor of the status quo? Wherever you find yourself, thanks for joining us on this journey. Hi, listeners. The conversation you are about to hear between myself, Garth Newfeld, and Jane Hallinan is one that grew out of uh, some email correspondences where I approached her about potentially working on a writing project related to heroic teaching. And uh, she rightfully asked, what does that mean? And, uh, and so we started a correspondence back and forth, um, which led to, uh, I think some misunderstanding about what this was, um, some realization that I was a little clear about what the ideas were, uh, were at that point and wanted to, um, kind of use her as a sounding board to work through them. Um, this wasn't easily done by email. And so we decided to have a recorded conversation about it. And what this uh, first conversation turned into was a conversation about choosing a metaphor that helps make sense of your career and uh, your career as a teacher. Some image that helps ground uh, the things that we do. And what we realized is that um, there are a lot of images out there and those can be mined for all kinds of connections. And sometimes they are good fit and sometimes they're not. Uh, We talk about being a juggler. We talk about weaving. We talk about being a mushroom grower. (laughs) We talk about a lot of things. Uh, But here's what you should do. Prepare yourself for... A conversation that is really a feeling out process. Um, And then, as we get into subsequent episodes, uh, we'll hope to define more of what it means to teach using a metaphor and maybe specifically the metaphor as a hero um, or the metaphor as um, the disturber, as Jane likes to uh, refer to herself. And maybe you'll find your own metaphor and maybe something here will resonate with you. So thanks for tuning in. Thanks for going on this journey with us on uh, teaching metaphors. Jane, I never know how to start these things, uh, but this, this conversation, uh, w- well, we don't know what it's going to be, but it, it came about in an interesting way where I tried to, oh, oh by the way, Jane Helen and welcome. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, this came in a, an interesting way because um, I had an idea. You and I like to share ideas. We um, do. Mm-hmm. And I had an idea. And then I was, it was the beginning of the term. Actually, it was summer before it was the beginning of the term. You said you were going to take some time in summer not to think about work. So I, I think I said, leave me alone. <laughs> I think that's what I said. I might not have been that direct, but I said, I'm trying no, to think- summer off. You know how sensitive I am. So I don't think you said that to me. Um, uh, but I gave you space in summer. I said, when you're ready to look at this, and then I never heard back from you. And then it was the beginning of term. And then I, then I started bothering you with more frequency. And then you said, I don't know why I've been putting this off. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Um, and but I start- can feel myself actively avoiding thinking about it. And that's a little unusual for me. Yeah. And, and people have no idea what we're talking about yet, which is great. It's great. It's yeah. great for it's good podcasting really is to keep the listener intrigued. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I'll just, I'll just say what I was, how this all started um, a number of years ago. And I don't even think I've told you this whole story, but a number of years ago, um, I wrote a, well, let me back up. A number of years ago, I started a couple of nonprofits and realized that I had all this passion to do these things. Uh, but 
I mean, everything was a learning curve. And so uh, everything was, you know, a struggle and I wasn't doing it. I'm sure there's industry standards or best practices if you had like a marketing degree or something like that, or if you were some sort of business, but I didn't have any of those things. And so I was just kind of making it up as I went along. And, and then you find sources and mentors and things that help you along the way. And then I came across this book and this book was called Story Brand. And uh, I used that book book. It, it, it's about clarifying your message. Um, and that might be, and this is the, the thing that you might not know, is that that was kind of the beginning of Top Inc. for me, uh, Teaching of Psychology Incubator, which we've done at um, the annual conference on teaching. That was um, kind of clarifying for me. It helped me, for example, for Tip Northwest, um, help me figure out exactly what our purpose is, um, why we're coming together, and and, and kind of narrowing all that mission stuff and then being able to communicate it really clearly to people. And then I realized that their system, if you want to call it that, or what they've tapped into, which I'll maybe talk about in a little bit, but um, that it works for a lot of different things. And so, um, and so I was interested, and we haven't obviously dug into it yet, but I was interested as I used it on all these other kind of ventures, um, would it work for teaching? Like, and, and the, the whole idea is the, well, yeah, it's the hero's journey, essentially that human beings, we are uh, creatures that love story and stories have a kind of mythical um, pattern to them <laughs> that where uh, there is a main character, main character struggles, the main character finds, finds help overcomes, fights their way out of something, and then in the end, uh, finds what they're looking for. And so I was wondering how that could be applied. And so, so I think that's the backstory. Do you, is, is that how kind of, is that helpful? Or did you know all that? Or how, how are you? Thinking? I, I think I knew most of it, but I think the, the uh, disclosure that you felt like you didn't know what you were doing and you kind of bumbled your way through until you find the right resources resonates with me because I think um, every time I've entered a new position or been in a new environment, even though I may have some experience that applies, I feel like I'm bumbling my way through to figure out how to redefine myself. So mm -hmm. I think that process is very, very familiar. Uh, do you remember a recent time when you bumbled? Um, I would say the last... <laughs> <laughs> the last major time I had that bumbling was when I moved down to Pensacola to take the dean's job. Uh, I knew how deans were supposed to behave, but I had never been one. And I remember the first day of work, driving to work, I got lost. And I, I remember calling my husband. I don't think I was crying, but I was saying, I was thinking, could this be a metaphor for having taken the wrong turn in life that I can't even find where my office is? And, you know, when you're a dean, people don't watch you come and go, which is one of the things that I learned relatively quickly. Uh, but just at that moment, it was it was startling to realize how much I really didn't know about what was going to be expected of me. So um, bumbling. Yeah. You, bu you, bu you bumble or you fake your way until you can realize whatever the, the role demands. Do you think that people who bumble, because I think we all do, uh, and, and I think that's one of the great things about learning new skills or whatever, is that there is this period where you don't know something uh, mm -hmm. and then you figure it out. Um, I think we've all come through the pandemic that way where uh, there's a lot we didn't know maybe about technology or about how to do things in a new way and we figured it out. I mean, I think where you're going is uh, talking about the novice to expert continuum and how in the beginning, the learning curve is just so, so steep. And in fact, as a COVID example, um, I, I'm a sort of slow adapter when it comes to technology. And so when we had so little notice to move online, that was that just seemed like a mountainous curve to learn. And even now, um, when technology changes, um, I still I still revert to being a bumbler. And now my students are sort of used to the fact that I'm going to say, somebody jump up here and help me figure this out um, so that we can get the class moving. 
Um, and I, I do require them to applaud me when I'm able to get through a technology <laughs> sequence without making a mistake. So here it is. I'm, I'm in week six of the uh, fall term. I know you've just started your term, um, but I'm now able to get through my entire week without making too many mistakes. But, you know, on that front end, it's that bumbler thing again. It's like, OK, now here's a brand new group of students. Do I have to out myself as a doofus when it comes to technology? And I usually do. And they, they think it's funny. A lot of people get through in that bumbling phase. I, I don't know if they ever feel like they're, they've got things kind of together. And so, that you know, we talk about being an imposter, feel, feeling like an imposter a lot. Uh, from my interviews with probably hundreds of people at this point, that is the norm. It is not the exception that people feel like they are faking it. And, and even well into career, I think. Hmm. Um, and so, you know, I think that is, you know, as I, as I think about story um, and I think about this common story, this thread that runs through um, maybe many teachers and probably even outside of teachers, professionals. Um, one of the things that people do need to fight is, um, is kind of that enemy of, uh, feeling incompetent, inadequate, imposterish, uh, or just bumbling, and what kind of meaning to make of bumbling? But it sounds like you're okay with bumbling. Oh, absolutely. Um, I, I think if you're an educator and you recognize the developmental nature of learning, I mean, I, I'm a true fan of thinking about things from a novice to expert strategy because I think it gives a lot of latitude for people who are just starting to learn. And in fact, whatever the agenda is, I tend to be most excited about working with bumblers because like, they're the most fun. They, they will be the most tail wagging when they're learning because it's exciting. Um, I, I love working with freshmen. I love working with brand new teachers uh, because there's just so much to learn. Yeah. So I, I, I have to say, I don't, I don't find that I experience imposter phenomenon at all. <laughs> Maybe in the beginning I did, but it's a little bit more useful to think of here I am on the continuum. I'm just starting out and I'm going to cut myself a lot of slack if I don't know how to do stuff. I was reading a book recently and uh, they were talking about how children uh, these days are so protected from not only, oh. you know, um, even walking to school and back, like maybe what we did when we were uh, little. And so they, they don't build this resilience within them. Uh, they don't get these lessons because they're so protected of kind of getting into complicated situations or, um, or, or something like that. And uh, feeling like they are, they have the tools, the skills to be able to, you know, get out of it. And I, I, I kind of see that with, if, if we don't put ourselves into positions of bumbling uh, that we, we will never be comfortable with the uncomfortable, if that makes sense. Um, right. Yeah. And that's, I think it also means that you have to be comfortable. And I think this is important as an educator. You have to be comfortable with uh, owning your mistakes, whether those happen in classes from day to day or whether they're examples that you can produce in whatever point you're trying to make. In fact, just this week in my capstone class, we were talking about getting ready for job interviews. And I shared with them that uh, uh, my friends at JMU will resonate with this, that when I applied for my job at JMU, when I was uh, director of the school there for five years, and they brought me in for my job interview, I was in the middle of my job talk when I looked down and saw I was wearing two different color shoes. <laughs> so... That was a little jarring, you know, kind of just an out of body experience while I'm still trying to make sense of whatever it is I'm saying, but thinking, oh, my God, look what I've done. And uh, I did. Um, I recovered my poise and continued, but it wasn't until after I got the job and I'd been there a while that uh, I was having lunch with some of the women faculty and shoes came up. And so I said, you know, I, I wondered if anybody noticed in my job talk and I didn't even get the sentence out before somebody said, oh yeah, we noticed. Uh, so it, it, that made a good lesson. It's sort of self-denigrating, which I know students thoroughly enjoy when we put ourselves in the situation of saying, yeah, let me tell you about a mistake I made. Um, and then it underscores the value 
of what you learn from making mistakes. I always check the color of my shoes now to make sure that I'm not walking out of the house mismatched. And that was the result of making that error. Yeah, well, uh, when when I had this idea that I floated to you probably at the end of spring, uh, even ideas I feel are like the nature of create creating is that you are bumbling. <laughs> I don't know what, it, and you and I, we've talked about this. We both agree that, um, that so, sometimes it, it feels almost more like it comes, uh, it comes from outside of you. We know it comes from within you, but it sometimes feels like that muse that taps you on the shoulder and says, do this now. And, um, and, and sometimes I have found that you don't get the next step. You just get the first step. You get like some, you get it's like uh, having a flashlight in a cave, and you get to look at the three feet in front of you, um, and you <laughs> and you don't get all of like. But but that is what you're talking about for those folks who like that. That's mm-hmm. an exciting place to be. Um, it's but, a very exciting place to be. But I definitely, when I had this idea, it's not an idea I'd want to share with everybody. Um, and I think this is the thing with ideas: you have to find people who will. Um, I didn't know if I didn't know if you'd be interested or not, but I did know that if I if if you weren't interested, you'd tell me why. I'd probably learn something about it. Um, and here we are, months later, and we're going to have conversations about kind yeah. of where this goes. So that's fun. Well, and it's interesting that you uh, invoke the muse here because that's exactly what happened when I figured out why I was being so sluggish in response. Um, usually, my best um, muse visits are in the morning, and I remember waking up and thinking, I I got to called Garth and I got to figure I got to figure out what's keeping you from saying yes because normally I will jump into anything with friends ask me if I can manage it mm-hmm. um, and then I started thinking and thinking and then it occurred to me it would you know there it is it bloomed it's like ah this is your story this is the thing that drives who you are mm-hmm. and how great that is. And I do want to ask you some questions so the audience will understand even better what that hero journey looks like as a teacher for you. But um, it occurred to me that I don't think of myself as a hero and that that would probably make it more difficult for me just to jump in and say, well, yes, let's celebrate this way of being. Um, And then I started thinking, well, if if I'm not a hero, then what am I? And then that put me in touch with some work that uh, I've done historically over time, which is to encourage people to think through what their metaphor is for teaching. And while mine has changed over time, um, my, my metaphor tends to be that I'm a disturber of the peace, that I like to rattle people's cages. I like to rattle student cages in particular, and that Uh, metaphor kind of, for me, put students smack dab in the middle of the experience. And so that's why the hero felt too me-centric, Yep. whereas my metaphor that I've embraced um, means that I'm I'm locked in combat or locked in um, struggle or wrestling with students trying to get to a different place in life. Mm. When I was sending those emails to you about this, every time I would send them, and, and they were lengthy, but I would send an email, a couple paragraphs or whatever. And then I would hit that send button. And then I would think to myself, that's not it. Uh, that's not what I, that it, it, it's not coming through. Um, and that happened, I think twice when in our, in our correspondences. And even now when you are uh, like, when you said, and what I really picked up on your email, which is I, I, I want to be student centered and this seems kind of teacher centered. And I still thought, well, I need to have a conversation with Jane to explain how I see this and it might be a little bit different. So we'll we'll talk about that. But essentially, and when people hear the the word hero, we're not talking like Avengers, Superman, whatever. Um, we're we're just talking about the greatness within people that can be unlocked once they face whatever those foes are that they need to face. And here is where I was stuck in those com- early conversations because the hero, every teacher is on a hero's journey. 
and every student is on a hero's journey. Now, when this metaphor is used for business, what the the idea is, or or like in a business setting. So, if you want somebody to, if you're selling, if I'm selling paint, and I want somebody to uh, purchase my paint, um, the myself and my paint store, we are not the heroes. Our job, in order to get you to listen to us, is to show, is to guide you, and to make you as the consumer of paint feel like you're the hero and we're just here to help you on your journey become the hero. So there are two things that I, uh, in this, with this metaphor that I, well, there's two possibilities and I was uncertain. Do, are there folks like you and me out there? And I, I'm in mid careers right, right now. Um, and so it's hard for me to put myself here because I still have so much to learn, but is there something that we have learned? That and I think the answer is yes. That we can be a guide to people for for instructors, and I think this is actually what you've already been doing for the last however many decades. That you are the guide that will help instructors become more heroic in their teaching. But there's also this second piece, which is instructors, teachers are the guides for their students to become heroic in their learning, and so. You know, if this idea was a book, that's two books. <laughs> you know, it's not just it's not just one. How do you uh, how do you hear that? Well, I think I resonate more with the second version because I think it uh, corresponds more to a student centered approach. Mm -hmm. And even though you say um, in the first version, the hero is in service to others, I'm not sure that always comes through when you describe it as a hero's journey, because there again, the emphasis on, is on the person in the cape, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to the person who's being served. So the, the servant leader model always has, has just had more appeal for me. And so I think if in fact, um, it's uh, one hero helping, helping students to become heroes in their own stories, I think that, that is, fits perfectly well. Um, and it, it does it does resonate with one of the things that I'm always trying to help students understand when we're talking about individual differences, which is that everyone is a hero in his or her own narrative. And so that's why when you get into struggles with people that they will always see themselves as the person who's in the right, because they're the hero in that narrative. And once you kind of understand that people take that position, it makes it a little bit easier to negotiate conflict and differences. You can tre you tread a little bit more softly. So, so hero has a, a very loaded um, sense for me. And so I think that uh, initially when you were describing it as the hero's journey, it's like, well, it's, yeah, it's too focused on the teacher out of the way I look at things. But that second version fits well. Yeah, okay. Well, let me ask you about that. Um, if, if it wasn't hero, if we weren't talking about teachers as heroes, but we were just talking about development of teachers to become better at what they do, to become more confident, to be, to really at the, you know, in, in a decade or two decades or whatever, to feel like you feel when you are not bumbling, when you're very confident about, uh, about things. If, if the metaphor changes, I think you you agree that it is important to inspire teachers and for them to feel like they're developing. And um, so how, I guess, how do you manage that? Like, and this is where I guess clarity of message happens, right? You can either talk to teachers about being better teachers for students. And maybe that's the primary way that you would like to think about it. Um, and that would be the student-centered way. But what about just teachers feeling feeling like more confident about themselves, more sure of themselves. Is, is that a different, is that a different idea? Um, I, th I think, I think it might be, I think uh, confidence is something that you're going to get as you progress from novice to expert. If you, if you're reasonable and you pay attention to feedback. Um, but I think in uh, over time, when I've worked with teachers and trying to become better teachers, it, it does help to find out what 
what is it that they are trying to do in the classroom? So that's where that metaphor idea comes in. For you, that metaphor is a hero. Um, for me, when I started out in teaching, my metaphor was that I was a juggler. It's like, what? Okay, mm. so the thought was, you know, I have all this content that I have to figure out how to keep the balls in the air and keep students' attention. But the fact is you can juggle without students in the equation, right? And so once I started thinking about I'm juggling, all I'm doing is I'm really focusing on the content. I'm not focusing on the intersection between the students and the content. And that moment for me was a kind of watershed moment where I went, I don't like that. Um, mm. I, I, I got to change metaphors. I've got to figure out a way to um, make more real what I think I'm trying to do with students, which is ultimately I want to help transform their lives, whether they want me to or not. Um, and so eventually that's where I migrated toward, well, I'm going to, I'm going to disturb their peace. They may not be on board with me in the beginning about where I want to take them. You know, they may be coming to class with the idea that they're just here for credits and I'm going to try to seduce them like crazy into liking the material that I'm going to produce, but I'm going to do that by trying to knock them off balance a little bit gently, but I'm going to knock them off balance. Okay. Give me an example because what we're talking about is now is metaphors. So I want to re let's stick a pin in that and come back just to metaphors, but sure. I'm, I'm interested in an example of how you might kind of no knock somebody around a little bit. Um, I, I would, yeah, knock somebody, that sounds more aggressive than I really am in, in my classes. But I'm shaking the say, cage. Yeah, yeah, shake their cage and try to, to be enticing in, in their learning. So, just one simple example is that when I'm working with students in, um, let's say, my history capstone, and you know, students love history of psychology. I'm saying that with sarcasm, but I love to teach history of psychology. And what I've learned is I don't say to them, you're going to do a literature review in this class, even though that's what they're going to do, I say, you're going to solve a mystery in history. You're going to be able to um, become an expert in this field that's smarter than anyone in the room, including me. And that right there takes them back because it's jarring for them to think that they would be smarter than me in some way in the, the course of the semester. And also that dangling, oh, I, I can you know, I'm going to be in this class and I can, I can solve something that people don't know about. Well, how cool is that? Well, that virtually defines research. But when you say to students, we're going to do a research paper, well, get the, get the yawns out and the eyeball rolls because that sounds boring. But a history mystery has a way of engaging people and giving them forward momentum. So it disturbs the piece in that positive way. I'm sure this has been more of a kind of a developmental thing for you where mm -hmm. um, you, you, you saw something that worked and you're like, what was that? And um, I need to do more of that. But do you sit around looking at assignments and thinking of assignments and think, no, that's too on the nose. We need to come through the side door with this one. Um, I have to say, I consider all the work that I do is, uh, I think the word is iterative, that it just continuously recycles and recycles and recycles based on what I learned from students. Um, so I'm, I'm never really completely satisfied with what the design is. Um, one of my mentors once said the thing about education is it never settles down. It's like, what? Yeah. It, 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 and it doesn't. It doesn't settle down because your students are going to be slightly different every semester. And uh, the set of instructions that work brilliantly in one semester is going to fall flat on its face in another semester. And you kind of have, I mean, that's where you're off balance a lot. And maybe the trick there is not to be, not to freak out when your own piece gets disturbed. It's like, oh, that didn't work. So let's try something else. Hmm. Yeah. You know, now that I'm listening for metaphors, they're all over the place, right? They like are. disturbance uh, mm -hmm. would be a, a type of metaphor. And I know that when we were working um, with the uh, Intro Psych Initiative, your team, uh, affectionately known as the Woolly Mammoths, um, yes. you, you all came up with uh, S some integrative themes for the student learning outcomes. And then uh, one of the conversations we had at some point was how 
how do we communicate these to people in the way that they'll really get it? And one of the metaphors that we use is weaving, uh, that these, these things get weaved. So when you were talking about juggling, I was like, well, what is the next iteration of juggling? Well, it might be weaving. Um, or, or something like that, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, what other metaphors have you heard or could we kind of kick around uh, that that might apply to teaching? Any off the top of your head? Yeah. I, uh, in the past, I've worked with people who have come up with uh, that they think of themselves as um, a butterfly in that they start out being kind of cocoon in a cocoon and then they emerge and they hope it's something beautiful at the end, which is kind of nice. Um, I've heard sculpting. I've heard dancing. I mean, I think one of the things I like about approaching um, how you're aspiring to be a teacher from a metaphor is that it it does produce a full range of examples. Um, I did hear organ grinder once, which is kind of interesting. It's like a are there monkeys in that one? And, you know, organ grinder as in the, yeah, instrument. like you've got a, you know, you're an organ grinder is the person that used to be um, a busker on the streets trying to get money. And you had a monkey that was dancing. So you yes. can see that some metaphors, when you hear them, you scratch your head and go, Ooh, you better tell me about that because where I'm going with this is probably not, not what you want. Um yeah, so I think it's it's a, a fairly personal experience. In fact, it's probably not a bad thing for listeners even to think about, well, what is what is my metaphor? What is it that I am attempting to be? What is it that I'm attempting to accomplish? And is there some concrete way of expressing that? Because at least what I found is once I embraced the great disruptor, um, that that was very liberating for me to be able to recognize that I'm I'm on purpose going to be putting students off balance because I think in the best Piaget sense of the, of the word, they're going to write themselves. And when they write themselves, they're going to be better off for that um, experience. Yeah. Yeah. I, I really, I really like that. Uh, It's, it's an interesting uh, it's an interesting way to, to approach student learning because um, you're, you're kind of, uh, well, students don't know what they're in for, right? They, I mean, I think students, they, do, they don't, yeah, they no. Don't. Um, and would you have, do you foresee that this is going to be the way that you will, the metaphor that will shape kind of your teaching until you retire? Um, whenever that is, uh, yeah. I suspect I'm pretty happy with it. In fact, I even found a little image that I use. Uh, if people have seen presentations that I've made, usually the very last slide shows this kind of funky little guy who's playing a tuba. And in the print, it says disturber of the peace. And so that for me is that way of communicating that guiding light. But we've talked a lot about my metaphor, and I think it might be more helpful uh, to talk about why the hero's journey appeals to you in the way it does. What is it about that metaphor speaks to you? Why is that so powerful? Yeah, I, I think there is, I really am interested in mythology and myth. Um, so, you know, Joseph Campbell wrote a lot about this and spoke a lot about it. Um, and even before that, you can find this pattern of the hero's journey in basically every historical literature, whether religious or not. Uh, but this journey that, um, that people go through Um, It's a developmental journey uh, that we are, you know, faced with. And I think it really resonates um, with, with me, but I think more, more broadly, I think with people, Um, I think it resonates on like on some deeper level than just conscious level, like processing, like this is, we might not know that it is speaking to us consciously and then something within us is drawn emotionally or motivationally or something like that to to the message and the message ultimately is uh i'm here for something more something greater um this is a process there's going to be ups and downs there's a lot at stake here there is um if i don't if i don't do this get this achieve this learn this um 
the consequences are dire. If I do, it's transformational. Um, it's, it's probably going to be everything I was hoping for. And so I find that, um, I also find the magic of it pretty, pretty interesting too. The fact that there's always a guide and we can look back on our lives and say, yeah, that person was a guide for me at that period of time or whatever. We might call them mentors in our field right now. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I, I like the idea because I think if you can tell that story, right, it resonates for teachers. I just, and I think what I was inviting you to do is help me tell the story for teachers because I know what the steps are. But for example, when we say that there is an enemy, there's a dragon that needs to be slayed by teachers. I don't know what that dragon is. I would, that's, Actually, I was just going to ask you if there'd be dragons in this story. So that's interesting that you leaped right into where I was going to take you. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Why were you thinking dragons? Um, because I, uh, again, I think the, the hero myth that you're, you're talking about in order for the story to be an interesting one, there has to be some high drama and you can't get much more dramatic than dragons. Yep. Right. So yep. that's what I was thinking. And if there are pushing that a little bit, if there are dragons right now, I'm sure there are listeners out there who might think of their department head, dean or president as the dragon that's making life a bit challenging for them. Um, so it, it might be institutionally, there are some things that get in the way of, of keeping us from being our best teacher. But the dragons of teaching, let me think about this. Mm -hmm. I guess for me, one dragon would be the the, the drag that happens in classes when students um, uh, fail to engage and when we fail to engage them yeah. so that you can see them sinking in their chairs, you can see them reaching for their phones. Uh, that for me, that's one of those enemies. That's a dragon. That's interesting. I'm, when you were talking, I'm having this, uh, any, any, any person who was born around, uh, you know, late seventies, early eighties, like myself, um, uh, the super Mario brothers video game <laughs> had you, uh, well, I guess they're going on and really it was, it was the hero's journey. Right. Um, so, mm -hmm. uh, but it wasn't one dragon. And I think this is what you're kind of picking up on. It's every level had a dragon on it. Every level, uh, was, was, and, and so when you're talking about iteration, I think it's not one time it's, um, it's this dragon now, and then it's that dragon later, and different dragons at different points in your career as well. Different politics to navigate, as you said. And mm -hmm. um, I could think about like kind of external forces being um, barriers to us, but then also there's the internal, which I think we've touched on as well, which is the feeling like an imposter or not having the skill set, wanting to try something new, but feeling basically incompetent at it. And for those folks who would and for the hero that would, or the non-hero who would take this safe way through and not challenge themselves, not make themselves vulnerable, I think you also just in the end, the metaphor says you miss out on coming home and coming home a transformed person to back and, and, and kind of all the good that you can do having had that journey. So I think that's a really good insight. And I think in particular, it speaks to the brand new teacher who goes into the classroom and, and feels compelled to be an expert on everything. And so when students ask questions, uh, some teachers deal with that by saying, don't ask me questions, which is sad. Um, other teachers deal with questions by punting mm -hmm. and hoping no one knows the answer because then they'll be exposed Whereas um, I think a great liberating force, I mean, get your cape out, is to be able to say, wow, what a great question. I don't know the answer to that at all. What do you think? Mm -hmm. And then convene that as an opportunity for students, again, to jump in, to let themselves get unbalanced, to take a risk, to be able to, to uh, see what they can do to penetrate whatever the mystery is that's at hand. Yeah. And that, ta that takes a little while. I mean, brand new teachers, you're so nervous about um, students thinking that you don't know your stuff. 
that to admit that you don't know something is just um, painful. And so people don't tend to do that. But I think once you can embrace, oh, there's so much I don't know. And yeah, you asked a great question. I don't know the answer to that. Mm-hmm. In fact, that just happened to me yesterday. I had a student, we were talking about gender issues and social, and I made a comment about differences in aggression patterns between males and females. And the student said, oh, yeah, what's your evidence for that? And, you know, in just at that moment, I had no study at my fingertips. So I said, well, you got me. I don't have it at this moment, but I'll have it shortly. And so this morning I emailed my students and said, well, here's some evidence that supports what it was I was saying. And I congratulated the student for challenging me on that point, because that's what I'm trying to do to get students to say, what's your evidence for believing what you believe? And so to have it happen in class is that was, uh, you know, um, a brand new teacher might be thrown off balance and might be unhappy. But Mm -hmm. I, I thought that was terrific. I thought it was terrific. Yeah. You know, if you have a strong metaphor, I feel like it can hold those experiences. Uh, take mm-hmm. the butterfly. I don't even know where I'm going with this, but I'll take the butterfly, for example. Okay. But if, if, if I'm an early career and I have this metaphor and I know that teaching is, you know, this transformational kind of butterfly experience for me, I also know that when that, in that moment, when that student, when it feels like that student could, could feel like that student's coming after me, questioning me, I, you know, and I could get very defensive. Uh, it might be something to hold on to in those moments and say, this is part of the process. This is part of the metaphor. And, mm-hmm. and that's not, that can change everything very, very quickly. Um, it can make you feel less flustered, maybe less defensive, less of an imposter, whatever those things are. Um, I, I, if we do multiple conversations uh, uh, for kind of this little podcast series at this point, what are you thinking these conversations should be about? Cause I can think of a, going a couple different ways, but maybe I'll just throw it to you for a moment. Um, if we were to do multiple ones, I think it would, I think it would be fun to convene some um, legendary teachers to get them to talk about what their driving metaphors are, because you, you and I both have, something that we hold on to that nourishes what we do. And I think it would be pretty interesting to be able to get that from some other people. Um, so that, that would be one direction. Another direction could be um, perhaps, perhaps I could interview you a bit more about the, the impact of what it means on a day-to-day basis for you to have the hero metaphor. What does it mean for your planning? What does it mean for um, when things go well? What does it mean if things fall and crash? Um, how might that support who you are? So that's another possibility. Yeah. And I mean, we could definitely take a dive into uh, yours as well um, and, and how you actually work that out. Um, and we've talked about it some of that. And I, I think the difference is that you sort of know how you're working it out. And for me, one of the, the metaphor sits well with me, the hero metaphor sits well, but I'm not sure how it's worked out. Um, I, I have, I think I sent you a list of like nine stages. Um, and I don't know what all those things are as I kind of discussed. So, um, it feels right to maybe back off, by the way, I love the idea of looking at different metaphors. Um, so maybe this is just all of the above. I'm not sure. Um, okay. The, the good news is we get to do whatever we want. So. That's true. <laughs> that part I love. By the way, I did think of one other metaphor that um, it might be reasonable to be closing in on, which is someone once said, I'm a mushroom farmer. Like, okay, explain that. Well, my students are the mushrooms and I throw manure on them and make them grow. It's like, Okay, so I think that probably communicates more about what you think of the profession than you may really want to intend. But that's what's really fun about the metaphors is there are subtexts that when you identify what you're talking about, you may not, you know, when I said I was a a juggler, I didn't I didn't get my own subtext until I was able to stand back and look at it and go, oh, wait a minute, that I don't like that. If that's what I really think, then I've got to change my style. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. The, the manure metaphor is, is uh, kind of fun because uh, we might say that you, it's it's your content, really. If we want to grow, grow skill 
skill based mushrooms <laughs> that um, the content uh it feeds it but it is uh it in itself is not is not the you know it's not the gold it's correct in fact, but the it opposite. also it is also uh, i mean the other thing that i look at in metaphors is is there any interaction going on there is there anything that's two way between the teacher and the mushroom and no, there's not. This is just uh, the teacher heaping dung on the student and hoping that some of them will make their way through the pile and become edible. Okay, that's stretching the metaphor a bit far, I have to admit. That's kind of bad. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm feeling like I still have work to do and I'd like for you to push me on it because in this teaching metaphor, you're right, there's a lack of students. <laughs> If it's an individual journey, I don't know yet. I don't know yet how students fit into that. Um, but as you and I were talking about Par Parker Palmer's book uh, yes. called, help me. Courage to Teach. Yep. Courage to Teach. Um, if I remember, it's very individualistic. It is about, it is about the calling, right? And um, And so... This reminds me a little bit of um, of my training as a therapist, which was in a family family systems therapy, essentially. But in a relationship or in a system, if you have one person who is helping themselves, figuring out how to set boundaries, figuring out how to communicate better, how to get their needs met, getting getting help, essentially making themselves better. The whole system rises because of that. Um, now it's the system doesn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> True enough. Um, yeah, but but the system gets healthier. So um, because that person is now not in the muck, uh, and so I wonder if there is something here, and maybe it's not a perfect metaphor, but um, maybe I wonder if there's something here about when people do feel called and they have this clear sense of what their purpose is and who the foes are and whether internal or external and, um, and they're looking towards, you know, slaying dragons and the transformation and the, the winds afterwards and what that means. Um, does that somehow, even if it's not directly involved with students, does that make this person better at what they do? I don't know with students. Yeah. Well, and I suspect, um, I suspect when I was a juggler, I was still a fine teacher. So I don't think the metaphor, your choice of metaphor, either um, secures or dooms you to a particular kind of future. Um, but I would agree with you that the individualistic focus of um, Palmer's book and maybe the concept hero's journey um, doesn't feel like it's taken people along in the way that I know you do as a teacher. And mm -hmm. so I would say, yeah, that, um, I don't know, it, the hero's uh, bus tour, <laughs> <laughs> you know, is, there, is there something that needs to be amended in there so that it feels more directly in service? Um, or maybe, try this one out, maybe it's that you're a hero maker. That, in fact, what you're focusing on is helping people be heroic by the transformation that they experience in their studying with you. Mm -hmm. That also tends to make it a, a bit more student-centered, but that that's clearly my bias. Yeah, I mean, I could definitely uh, apply this to students really easily, but that is not right now. The, the call here right now is to try to figure out what this means for teachers. And, and it's funny that I'm I know that you're talking it, it, now. Now I'm talking about teachers kind of as a group of people and not as Garth, the individual, mm -hmm. because I actually haven't even applied this to myself quite yet. Um, and so I don't know that it's the best metaphor for me, <laughs> Okay, but I do think it's a it's a it's an in interesting metaphor. The last thing I will say is when the hero leaves home, uh, it, I think that there's something there about leaving your students um, and and then returning to your students, a changed instructor, um, at having gone through all those things. Now, the, the interesting thing is we're never without students. So even during those, those times where we're out slaying dragons, we're still teaching on the side, right? And so right. you're never, it's not like you are physically or metaphorically even leaving. Um, and yet, 
And yet you do, uh, after you have certain experiences, build certain skills, after you bumble around a little bit, you do come back changed. So, um, yeah, let's, uh, let's put a, put a pin in this, uh, you and I will talk on the side and we'll come back with uh, episode two. Okay. Sounds good. 